I'm going to start uh, number six all over again. It's, no, let's not do that. Let's just let's just uh, pick up here where we left off. I couldn't record yesterday. Technology was down. But what we were doing on example six is trying to come up with equivalent transformations. Bless you. There's uh, usually more than one way to obtain a desired result, and it all depends upon which function we're working with. So for the function f of x equals x, uh, what we're doing on the, all of these problems is we're replacing x with 9x on the inside. So if you replace x with 9x on the inside, the 9 is a b value, and of course it's going to be a horizontal compression by a factor of 9. So what we're going to be doing on all the rest of the problems is trying to manipulate it somehow so that we get the B from the inside somehow maneuvered to a different location. There you go. Whether it's on the outside and becomes an A or somewhere else like a C or a D and see if there's another equivalent way to get it. On the linear function, it was kind of trivial. Just putting your parentheses or grouping symbols in a slightly different place, you can turn a B value of 9 into an A value of 9. And we said that a horizontal compression by a factor of 9 then <laughs> was equivalent to a vertical stretch by a factor of 9 also. Yeah, and I showed you what the graph looks like. On part B, we had the graph x squared or the function x squared, so a 9 on the inside is still going to be a horizontal compression by a factor of 9. But to actually do the math that's implied here, 9 squared becomes 81 on the outside. So it's a, it's a B value of 9 but an A value of 81 which means that horizontal compression by a factor of 9 is now equivalent to a vertical stretch by a factor of 81. Okay, and that brings us to letter C. So when we plug in a 9x for x into our particular function, we get 9x quantity cubed, which, of course, is going to end up being a horizontal compression by a factor of Nine. Are you okay with me abbreviating that? Quick before. Are you okay with that? Yeah. Okay, good. If you're okay with it, I'm okay with it. I just don't want to have to write it each and every time. Horizontal compression by a factor of nine. Now, to get it to the outside, let's use our grape here. What would I do? Nine x quantity cubed is the same as nine cubed x cubed, and you've already got nine cubed. 9 squared is 81, so 81 times 9 would be 9 cubed, 9 squared is 81 times one more 9, 729, okay. Is this legal to go off to the side and do some old school multiplication? Yeah, it's not only legal, it's nostalgic, it's fun. Uh, 729. Okay, so here we go. A horizontal compression by a factor of 9 now is equivalent to a vertical stretch by a factor of 729. Now, on the actual test, I don't want you to put VS before. You could put BFO by a factor of, but you can write out vertical stretch. Okay, you got the idea? All right. Uh, let's do the first one together, and then you come up with the second one for this problem on your own. The first one's going to be pretty pretty much the same every time. But if our – yeah, go ahead. As the powers get larger, yes, the vertical stretch becomes more and more severe. Yeah. So if you're thinking about saving labor – it almost seems like compressing it by a factor of 9 would be a lot easier than vertically stretching it by a factor of 729, right? Because that's a big number. But they are equivalent. Huh? Oh, it's Boston Celtics. It's Larry Bird, one of my childhood heroes. Yeah, okay. Um, so if I replace X with 9X on the inside, of course, bless you, bless you, that is going to be a... Horizontal compression by a factor of 9. And I'll, I'll try and color code these as well the same. There you go. Right? We're taking the radical function and compressing it horizontally by a factor of 9. I'm going to give you one minute to come up with the equivalent, if there is an equivalent way to get it.
First play tonight. I almost wore my Tim Junkin jersey, but it goes down to my to my shins because he's tall. Who's the got it? Who's the got it? What you, what'd you get? Um, three times the square root of X. Okay, and so that's equivalent to a? Uh, vertical stretch by factor three. Does everyone agree? Vertical stretch by factor three? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, to simplify that, remember we have the rule that says uh, the square root of multiple factors is the product of the square roots of those factors. So we can call that square root of 9 times square root of x, and of course the square root of 9 is 3. Do we take plus or minus? Is it plus or minus 3 or just 3? It's just 3. Very good. Because if the, if the radical is already there, we take the indicated root. Yeah? When do, we, when do we consider plus or minus? When we introduce it. When we take the square root of something uh, in, in our attempt to solve an equation, a conditional equation. Yeah. So there you go. It's a vertical stretch by a factor of three. There you go. Vertical stretch by a factor of three. Let's look at the graph of that. Uh, we didn't do the graph on some of the other ones, but this one's kind of nice. The parent function is, uh, let's do the parent function in yellow so it doesn't show up too much. There it is. Now, if we uh, horizontally compress it by a factor of nine, let's do that one in pink. The bigger the x value is, the more it's coming in, right? So if like that x value was at 9, now we're bringing that all the way into 9, aren't we? Or into 1. Sorry, that would come way in here to 1. This is coming in. This is coming in. So the smaller the x value, the less it moves. And, of course, 0, the x value at 0 is, is, stays the same. So it does have the effect of making the graph whatter? Steeper, right? Well, the, the math says we can then accomplish the same goal by taking the yellow graph and vertically stretching it by a factor of 3. So taking all the y values and tripling them. So the y value at 0 times 3 is still 0. And then all these other y values, like if this were a y value of 4 right here, it's now going to be a y value of 12. And so you can see that you do accomplish the same thing. So it's kind of nice to see that. For this particular function, right. It's different for every function, yeah. But by decreasing the x values, you're increasing the y values. All right, x to the negative first. That's also known as what? Is that a parent function? That's your reciprocal function, yeah. So uh, let's see. The transformation would be 1 over, if we replace x with 9x, that's inside, that's in the denominator. Use your copy and paste thing. That's going to be, of course, an 8c before, right? Horizontal compression by factor of 9. Give you 30 seconds. Go ahead and rewrite it and see if you can figure out what the equivalent transformation is. This one you got to be careful. Very easy to make a careless mistake. Who's got it? A horizontal compression by a factor of 9 is equivalent to a um, vertical, vertical yeah. stretch compression stretch by a factor of 9? Nine. Yeah, it's going to be vertical, but is it a stretch or compression? Hmm. Well, that depends, right? 1 over 9x, is that the same as 1 over 9 times 1 over x? Because when you multiply straight across, yeah, it is. So when you bring that 9 to the outside, it's not a 9 on the outside, which would be a vertical stretch by a factor of 9. 
It's a one ninth on the outside, which now makes it a vertical compression by a factor of nine. Yeah, good. We're making it nine times shorter. So in this case, you know, you just ask Weston if you're making the x value smaller, does it make the y values bigger? In this case, making the x value smaller also makes the y value smaller. Yeah. Okay, cool. Let's keep it going here. The absolute value of x. Of course, the first one, if I plug in a 9x for x, that is going to be a copy and paste. An 8c before 9, horizontal compression by a factor of 9. What would the equivalent one be alternatively? Right, because we have this little property that says that the absolute value of a times b is equal to the absolute value of a times the absolute value of b. And of course, what's the absolute value of positive 9? 9. So almost like a linear function, very similar to a linear function, in this case a horizontal compression by a factor of 9 is equivalent to a vertical stretch by a factor of the same number, 9. Good. Now they're getting interesting. Our two favorites, or at least my two favorites, maybe they're your two favorites too, but at the bottom of your favorite list, right? You're, they're your two favorite, least favorite ones. If you have a, like a list that says, these are my least favorites, they might be at the top of that list, right? they would be your favorite, least favorites. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you don't even have lists. If I replace x with 9x, you get that. And that, of course, is a by a factor of 9. Yeah. Now, I'm going to go ahead and graph this because these are, these are new. Um, and I'll draw the parent function in yellow. Now, again, that's just giving us something uh, to compare the other functions to. That's not necessarily the correct steepness. But uh, from there, I can then compare... If I compress that horizontally by a factor of 9, every y value is coming in, or I'm sorry, every x value is coming in. So the x-intercept at 1 is now going to be at 1 ninth, right? And the closer it is to the uh, y-axis, the less it moves. So it still has the vertical asymptote there. It has the effect of making the graph what? Steeper. Okay. Let's see if that's correct. How would you rewrite that one. Is there a way to do it? Can you just bring it on the outside and say it's that? I don't know. Is there a property? Can you write it as the natural log of 9 times the natural log of x? Does that work? Y'all remember your properties of logs from Algebra 2? No? no. Didn't hesitate. Just no. No. Yeah, the reason most people uh, dislike logs is because there's so many different rules to remember, but that's the exact same reason why logs are so useful. So here is the property that we're going to use, and we'll study this again in greater detail later on. But logs, they cut their, everything down to size. That's the whole purpose of a log. It's the, it's the inverse operation of exponential, so they make big numbers really, really small. So the log of a product actually turns into the sum of the logs. Does that kind of ring a bell at least? A tiny little bell? <laughs> the log of a product is the sum of the logs. So the natural log of A times B is the natural log of A plus the natural log of B. That's true. So with that in mind, I can write the natural log, let's rewrite it. I can rewrite the natural log of 9x as what? The of plus the natural log of X. Good. Now to write that in standard transformation form, that would be the natural log of x plus the nat plus the natural log of 9, not just 9. And this ends up being what? An a, b, c, or d value in our center transformation form. It's a d value. Natural log of 9 is just some positive number, right? So in this case, a horizontal compression by a factor of 9 is equivalent to a... Yeah, not horizontal. Good. A vertical, you said it correctly, shift. And we don't say by a factor of if it's shift, right? Because factor of means multiply. Vertical shift up natural log of 9 unit. Oh, okay. Let's see how that would work. If I take my yellow graph here, I can horizontally compress it to get the blue graph. That's what I showed there with the arrows. 
But apparently I could also take this yellow graph and just slide it up. See that? Now mine don't perfectly line up because I was I didn't use the other one to mirror it, but that's essentially what we're doing. So if you want to show it extreme, move it down, compress it, and now it's going to be equivalent to some type of vertical shift. That's pretty interesting. Okay. So not always is it going to end up being a dilation as well. That's all the ones before have been dilations, but for a log it ends up being a shift. All right, how about e to the x? Last one here, f of x equals e to the 9x. That's our new function. Maybe we should be calling these g of x all along, but we can give them the same name. So that's going to be a horizontal compression by a factor of 9. See if you can uh, mess around with that one for a couple of seconds and see if you can come up with its equivalent. Sure. Now, because e, and, e to the x and natural log of x are inverses, you might think that this one's going to have a rather interesting result as well. We shall see. You may not remember your... Um, properties of logs, but I know you remember your properties of exponents, because we studied those a lot earlier in the year. <laughs> I got it. Dang, they get me every time. They like to play jokes on me in the office. Let's let it ring once, and Corpy will run over there, and we won't let it ring again. Hey, just an FYI in the future, just kind of a life skill, if you're ever going to wear two different shoes, Try to make sure that they're the same height, so that you're not walking around like this all day long. I didn't check that. Yeah, one has a bigger sole than the other, so yeah, back problems. Anyway, just a life skill, life hack. <laughs> oh. Anyone get it? Um, you got it. Well, okay. I guess. Okay. Well, guessing is better than not guessing. Okay. Hmm. You said it was, uh, thank you, by the way, for your braveness. You said it was e to the x times 1 to the ninth. What is 1 to the ninth power? 1. What's 1 times e to the x? e to the x. Is e to the x e to the 9x? No. But it was a good try. It was a good try. Just doesn't quite work. You got to think of what we could do with the exponent. Huh, let's look at our rules of exponents. If I had a to the x times y power, that's the same as a to the y times x power. I could commute the factors. Is that okay? Yeah, I don't know if that'll help me. But notice I could also do this. That's the same as a to the x to the y power, which is also the same as a to the y to the x power. Is that true? Because when you raise a power to a power, you what multiply? Multiply, yeah, so it works. So will that help us here? I can write that as e to the x times ninth power, which means I can then write that as e to the x to the ninth power. Question or stretch? Stretch, okay. Um, so that's true. Is that a transformation, though? Have we talked about a transformation where you raise something to a power? No. Hmm. So is there a way then to get that 9 as an exponent either into an A, B, C, or D? Into a multiplier or something that's being added or subtracted? I don't think so. None. This one has no equivalent one, believe it or not. Let's see what, let's see what the graph is doing here. I'm kind of curious now. Y'all get curious? It's okay for humans. Not so good for cats, I hear. So feel free to be curious. All right, if I take this graph of y equals e to the x, and I horizontally compress it by a factor of 9, then um, that one's going to stay there. This is all coming in. The more, the farther away it is, the more it comes in. So these come in less and less. This comes in pretty small. This comes in pretty small. So if I connect those dots, it's going to look something like that. And apparently, there's no vertical stretch that's going to make it happen. Why not a vertical stretch? I mean, it looks like I could take, it sure looks 
it sure looks like I could take this value here and stretch it up to that pink one, right? And it sure looks like I could take that one and stretch it down to that one. And it sure looks like this one I could take and stretch it up to that one. Well, which – all the Y values go up except which one? Which one stays locked in? The Y-intercept. And if I vertically stretch that, what's the Y value there to start with? What's the Y-intercept of V to the X? One. So if I vertically stretch everything else, I'm going to have to multiply that Y value of one times the same number, and it doesn't move. So there is no vertical stretch that works. Lay bummer. Will a horizontal compression work? Yeah, that's what we started with. That's the only one. If you move this thing left or right, it's not going to work. Of course, if you move it up or down, that's not going to work either because up or down will move the what? The horizontal, the horizontal asymptote, yeah. And that can't, that can't move. So this one has none. Now, before we depart and go to the next one, let me just uh, kind of point out this to you. And I maybe should have mentioned it over here. I know I should have, not just maybe. I should have. Remember that logs and exponentials are related how? They're inverses of each other. So really the rules of logs are really the same as the rules of exponents, just kind of turned on their head. The log of a product becomes the sum of the logs, right? That ring a bell with y'all? If I have um, a to the x times a to the y power, what are the rules of exponents say we do? You add the exponents, right? That's a to the x plus y. This is essentially that same rule. Logs and exponentials are inverses of each other. But notice what happened here. We took a multiplicative process, a to the x times a to the y, multiplication, and it turned into a what problem? Addition, right? When we are multiplying, it turned into addition. And that's exactly what the log does. It turns multiplication, a times b, into addition, natural log of a plus natural log of b. That's pretty cool. Natural logs or logs always bring the operational level down one rung. It turns exponentiation into what? What's right below exponentiation on the order of operation ladder? Multiplication. Logs turn exponentiation into multiplication, and they turn multiplication into addition, and they turn addition into... No, you took the bait. No, subtraction and addition are on the same rung, right? Multiplication and division are on the same rung. I don't know if there is a rung below addition, huh? That's the bottom rung. It's not a very tall ladder, right? Addition, multiplication, exponentiation, and who's on the top rung? Parentheses, yeah. So not the best ladder to use if you're trying to hang Christmas lights, yeah? For more than one reason. All right, any questions on that? These make great test questions and quiz questions. All right, example seven. Um, we're going to go through this really quickly. Remember I told you that the transformations affect every starting graph in the exact same way. The parent functions are graphs that you have to memorize. So you have to produce the original graph so that you can transform it. But sometimes you might be given just a graph of a function that has no equation, and you might be asked to sketch transformations of it. Well, it's going to affect the graph in the exact same way. So I'm going to show you a real clever way to do this. If we're starting with this function right here, which looks like uh, the Charlie Brown shirt pattern, right? Um, we're going to perform the following transformations on this function here. If I take that function, which I reproduced here on part A for our convenience, and I replaced x with 3x, what is that going to do to any function? Which way compress it? Okay, so it's going to be a horizontal compression by a factor of what? 3. So all the x values come in by a factor of 3. So here's what's going to happen. This x value at 1... Is going to come into what? One third, right? And this x value at two is going to come in by a factor of three to two thirds, yeah? And this, this x value over here at three is going to come in by a factor of three to one. So notice if I wanted to connect the dots, it's going to go up to one, down to a third, up to one, down to two thirds, up to one, back down to one. And that would be graphing it all the way out here to what used to be 3. And then we'd do the same thing on the other side. You would partition that into 3s. It would go up and down to negative a third, up and down to negative 2 thirds, up and down there. And then it would continue going in that same pattern. So there you go. You can kind of see now 
that it's like the bellows of an accordion. Hey, Worst Fest is only in nine days. Did y'all know that? Nine days away. And you might see this happening at Worst Fest, right? Like an accordion, you compress it, and of course on the accordion they pull it back out, and that's what makes the sound. Oh, and what a good sound it is this time of year. So that's one way to draw it. That's one way to draw it. And this one is nice because we see the original function in the background, and we see the new graph in the foreground, right? We can compare them on the same coordinate plane. Now, if you want to copy and paste that somewhere else, that's fine, because I'm going to show you a quick way. If you just want to graph the resultant graph, if you just want to graph the final graph, here's all you have to do. We're compressing it by a factor of three, so all my x values are a what of what they used to be? A third, okay? Here's all you have to do. Just relabel your axis. Instead of calling that one, call it a third. This is two, so now it's two-thirds. This is three, so now it's three-thirds, or one. Is that what y'all were thinking beforehand? No? That's clever. That's a clever way to do it. And now, of course, now it's perfect. The scales are different now on the X and Y axis, but because it's labeled, it's perfect. Sweet. You don't get to compare and contrast with one uh, with the other, but who needs that? We've got this idea, don't we? Okay, the next one. X thirds. What's another way to say X thirds? One third times X. Good. Which now that's going to be a horizontal stretch by a factor of three. All right. So this would be the accordion going out. Let's do it the cheating way. It's not actually cheating, right? If you're just interested in one graph, it's the it's the fast, fun, effective, efficient way. So this X value at one, we're going to stretch it horizontally by a factor of three. It goes all the way out to what? Three. So what's one times three? Three. This old X value here at two is now going to be stretched by a factor of three. It goes to what? Six. And this three here goes to nine. So negative three, negative six, negative nine. There's the new graph. How does it look? Starts with P, rhymes with derfic. Perfect. Yeah, it's perfect. Are the scales the same anymore on the X and Y? No. But who cares? Do you care? I don't care. You think they're going to talk about this at the Republican debate tonight? You think this is one of the hot issues that people care about? No. No. As long as it's labeled, it's good, right? Perfect. Good morning. <laughs> I figured today you'd wear one of each of your New Balance shoes on Michigan's Day. You were thinking about it. But they would probably they would probably get upset if they were split up, right? Because they're so awesome, those shoes. Right? One of them's red. Yeah, you don't want to do that. I was dangerously close with the pink. We do candy. Yeah, so we own the red now. Yeah. You know, when, uh, when, when, when they ended the Civil War, um, Abraham Lincoln had the, uh, the presidential band play, guess what song? The Union won. And Abraham Lincoln had the Union official presidential band play. Dixie, which was the southern anthem during the Civil War. And you know what he said? He said, play Dixie, because now we own it. If what? Um, if you predicted the score and won. Yeah, and I said predict the score. What did you predict the score to be? I did say predict the score. I believe you, I thought you said that we were going to win 100 to 0, and that was close. Okay, let's do this one here. Uh, what is the negative 3 going to be? Uh, a reflection. And across what axis? X -axis. X axis reflection and a vertical stretch. Vertical stretch by a factor of 3. three. Okay, so does it matter the order in which we do that? No. Now, if we reflect it across the um, x-axis, that's going to make it look like this. It's going to go down to negative 1 instead of up to positive 1. So we do have to kind of draw a new graph. But now, for the vertical stretch by a factor of 3, that's going to be easy. All I have to do is get rid of this 1 up here so the scale's not that. And what's, what's the new low point going to be? 3. No, the low point. Negative 3. Good. So it doesn't matter if you wanted to stretch it first, and the high point from 1 would go to 1 times 3, which would be 3. 
and then reflect it, so now it's negative 3, or reflect it, now the low point's negative 1, and then multiply that by 3, and you get negative 3. Because they have the same priority level, right? They're on the same rung, multiplication, negative 1 and, and positive 3. All right, this last one here, if we rewrite it, that's going to be one-third f of negative x. That does also two things. What are the two things? What does the one-third out front do? Vertical press by factor of, what did you say? Three. Three, good. And then the negative x, y-axis reflection. Yeah. Now, does it really matter the order in which we do those two? No, because they're both multiplication. Again, if you do the standard transformation form, though, you can always go from left to right. It's just a nice, convenient, systematic way to do things. Okay, now let's look at the y-axis reflection first. If I reflect that graph across the y-axis, are we going to see any change? No. Why not? It's, uh, I heard it. It has y-axis symmetry, which means it's an even function. No, my bad. Um, so what does that mean? If it's an even function, f of negative x is equal to f of positive x, right? So there's really nothing to show there. So all we have to do is show that we're compressing it vertically by a factor of 3, so the high point now at 1 will become what? A third of 1, which is 1 third. How's my graph now? Starts with P, rhymes with derfic. Perfect. Yeah, notice I just changed the Y value at the high point from 1 to a third. Beautiful. Yeah. Now, if you wanted to sketch it in contrast to the original one, I understand. Just come down here to a third. And there's your new high points, right? And it looks something like that. And that might make like a good design for a, another Charlie Brown shirt or something. Now, if you have accordions that play like that, that's a weird accordion. I don't think that's how they compress and stretch, right? They don't play the accordion like that. If you do, it probably does not sound very good. So either way, got it? Pretty easy? Now, notice I didn't do any shifts on this graph, right? But you could also do shifts. You could pick it up and move it left, right, up, or down. Y'all look bored. This is too easy. I apologize. Okay. The last ones we're going to talk about. Absolute value transformations. Absolute value transformations. Absolutely important. Okay? Absolutely important. There are, there are basically two of them and then the combination of the two. The first one is if we take the absolute value of the entire function. I'm going to go a little faster here because we're kind of running out of time. If you take the absolute value of a function, let's think about what the order of operations are going to do. Let's say we're starting with some function f of x, some graph or some equation. By the way we evaluate functions, we start with our x value, right? We choose it independently, and then we apply it to the function. No big deal. But the last thing that we do before we graph it is do what to those y values? Make them positive. So if the y value is like a positive 5, what happens if you take the absolute value of it? It stays the same, positive 5. But what if your output, your y value, is like negative 5? it becomes positive 5, right? So it's the same magnitude, but it's now positive. So this graph, by definition, should not live below the x-axis, right? You're not going to have any negative y values. If there were any negative y values on the original function, they're the same distance away from the x-axis, but they're now up here in positive land. Well, you could have shifts after the fact. Yeah, we're not going to do the shifts on these. We're just going to look at these in isolation. So what can we do then to generate this graph from the original function? If all the y values are positive, nothing happens to them, right? We leave them alone. But if we have negative y values, we want them to be positive, and we want them to be the same distance away from the x-axis, only on the positive side. We could reflect the negative y values across the x-axis. Yes. So here's what we're going to say. For this transformation... We're going to leave positive y values alone. They become part of the new graph because they're already positive. And then we're going to reflect all negative y values across the x-axis. Now, this is a very important transformation like in physics because you have the relationship between velocity and speed. And speed, believe it or not, is the absolute value of velocity. 
So if you want the speed graph and you have the velocity graph, you would apply this transformation to it. All right, let's try it out with the natural log of x. You ready? How much time do we got? Twelve minutes. Okay, we can do this. Let's graph the natural log of x. That's a parent function. Let's do it in red because we own it. Right, Jared? Mm -hmm. All right, so there's y equals the natural log of x. Now, in blue, all right, in blue, right, we're going to dominate the red now. With blue, we're going to apply the new transformation, the absolute value of the whole function. So these are all the y values that we're going to generate inside the absolute values, but before we graph it, we're just going to make them positive. So all positive y values, which are these, stay the same. What about zero? What about when y is zero? What's the absolute value of zero? Zero. And then all the negative y values are becoming positive. So it's going to look something like this. We reflect just that negative piece down here across the x-axis. Does the vertical asymptote become affected by that? No. no. We're only going to be approaching infinity. There's no negative values anymore. But there you go. That's what the blue graph is. Be careful on the curvature. The way it curves is important, okay? It actually kind of is coming in now from the left, looking like a parabola. It's, it's curving upwards, we say. And then at the x-intercept now, it curves downward like the radical function. It's almost like you took this graph like a chicken bone and went, ugh, right? We call this thing right here, because now it's a sharp turn, we call it a cusp. It's a cusp. It looks like an inverted shark fin, yeah? Did that change the domain of the function? No. Did it change the range of the function? Yeah, it did. The range used to be all real numbers all day long, right? But now the range is... Except for all the negative ones, right? So how can we say it? Yeah, set of all y such that y is greater than zero? Greater than or equal to, yeah. Or zero to infinity, good. There's no negative values anymore. And there shouldn't be negative values because what's the last thing we do before we graph it? Uh, the Across the x-axis to make them positive. Good. All right. Uh, the next one is equally as important. Notice it is y equals f of the absolute value of x. So rather than taking the absolute value of the outputs, we're taking the absolute value of the inputs. Inputs. Now, what does that mean? That means that if we choose a positive x or a negative x, by the time they get to actually get plugged into the function, what happens to them? They become positive. So all positive x's and negative x's are going to graph exactly the same, yes? Yeah? What type of function do we call that when the positive x's and the negative x's have the exact same output value? Even function. This function, by definition, should have y-axis symmetry. Should have y-axis symmetry. It's going to be an even function by design. Okay, so here's how we can come up with the, the um, rule of thumb, you could say, for sketching it. What if your x value is already positive? Is it going to be affected when you take the absolute value of it? No. So we're going to leave all positive x values alone. Which quadrants do we find positive x values? Uh, one, one and four. Yeah, quadrants one and four. So quadrants one and four stay the same. If you want to add that over there, um, well, no, we'll just say positive x values stay the same, quadrants one and four. And then what happens to the part of the graph that used to live in negative x land? Do we even see that? We don't even see that because... When we choose a negative x value, we never actually generate the actual function value that used to be there at negative x land, right? Because the function now thinks that it's a positive x. So it's going to graph, again, on the negative x side, every y value that is on the positive x side. You got it? So anything that might have lived in negative x land, whether there was something there or not, it doesn't matter. It's going to graph everything on both sides as if it were positive. So... We're going to leave positive x values alone. Then they're going to reflect 
those two quadrants, quadrants one and four, across the y-axis. You're actually going to generate the graph using the built-in symmetry of the function. Okay? Let's try it with natural log of x. What, what do you mean by stuff? Well, no, let's, let's look at this. Here's the natural log of x, okay? Let's go ahead and graph in blue the natural log of the absolute value of x. Now, once again, if I choose positive x values, I'm going to be taking the absolute value of them. So um, they should be the same in positive x land, right? Like if I choose positive 1, the natural log of the absolute value of positive 1 is the same as the natural log of 1, which is, zero, so on and so forth. So all these values are going to be the same. We still can't take the natural log of zero, so there's still a vertical asymptote. Now notice that the natural log function only lives to the right of the y-axis, correct? It only lives there. I can't take the log of a negative number, but now notice I can come over here to x equals negative one, and I can plug it into my transform function, right? Because let's do it. I get y equals the natural log of the absolute value of negative 1. But before I drop it into the natural log function, which doesn't allow negatives, what happens? It becomes positive 1. And now I get 0. So, oh, okay, I'm going to get that value there. If I plug in a negative x value to the left, it's going to be the same as the y value over here. So what's going to happen is we generate a whole other branch over there in negative land. So, again, here's the rule of thumb for this one. Because we're taking the absolute value of x, all positive x values over here in quadrants 1 and 4, they'll stay the same. Whatever might have lived over there in negative land, whether that was a graph or not, you're going to get rid of it. Because you're going to graph everything over there like you did over here. So you take the graph from quadrants 1 and 4 and you do what with it? You reflect it across the y-axis and you generate your new graph. If something was there before, it's gone. This reflects across and you have y-axis symmetry built in. You actually use the symmetry to generate the graph. Okay, um, the last one here is combining both of them. Doesn't that look fun? You actually value the natural log of the natural of the absolute value of the absolute value of the natural log of x. Well, it could be the same as the first one. There's two of them, though, going on here. Remember that your multiplication, your a and b, you could do those in either order because they have the same priority. Right? They're on the same rung. These are both on the same rung, algebraically. So you could do either one first. So let's go ahead and use our graph from up here. If I wanted to do the outside one first, you just do them in sequence. If I do the absolute value of the natural log of x, I end up with this blue graph. And then if I apply it to the inside, what is the inside rule? Leave quadrants 1 and 4 alone. I'm going to have this blue graph and do what? Reflect it across the y-axis, okay? So that would generate, let's use a different one. That would generate this from working on the outside. And then if I do the inside one, I reflect that across the y-axis. And you get a graph that kind of looks like a cool-looking W. Now that's if you work from the outside in. Do the absolute value of the whole thing first, and then reflect it across to get the whole graph in purple. Now you could also do it the other way around. Let me show you. If you want to do the inside one first, of course, you're going to get this graph here on both sides. And now we can apply the outside one, which, remember, says take all your negative y values and do what? Reflect them up. So then it's going to come up here. It's going to come up here, and the positive y values stay the same. So either way, we get the same graph. They have the same priority level. You just do one and then the other. All right, we got like... Two minutes left. Let's, let's practice them here. Here's a generic sketch. Uh, let's color code it. Let's do this one in purple since that's what I have. What's the rule of thumb for this one? The last thing we're doing is we're taking the absolute value of all the y values. So if the y values are already positive, same. If they're negative, they become positive. So reflect all your negative y values across the x-axis. Here we go. Let's find the positive y values first. Positive, positive, positive. 
Positive, positive, positive. There we go. There's the positive values. You negative guys, attitude adjustment. Here you go. Now you're positive. And there you go. You get the graph that looks like maybe the beginnings of a Bactrian camel. If you wanted to draw that, a Bactrian camel. They have a little tail. I don't know. A Bactrian camel has two humps as opposed to a dromedary camel that has just just the one. Anyway, there we go. Let's pick a flavor for this one. What flavor do you want? Green. Let's let's go with green. All right. Um, what does this one do? The rule of thumb. Well, first, let's keep the part that stays the same. All the positive x's stay the same, right, Weston? Mm -hmm. Well, that's going to be all the ones. Let's not choose green because the graph itself is green. Let's use beefy brown. If x is positive, it stays the same. So it's going to be it's going to be this one here. Everything in quadrants one and four stay the same. Now, anything that might have lived in quadrants two and three for this one, they gone, right? And all we have to do is reflect this one across the y-axis. Turns out brown was a really good choice because this isn't the Bactrian camel graph. This is the le moustache graph, right? The handlebar mustache graph. What happened to this little linear piece over here in quadrants two and three? Well, the graph didn't know it existed because you're taking the absolute value of x first. So it's going to graph all your negative x's and positive x's at the same time. Now, for the final one, all you have to do is do them in sequence. Let's choose red because we own it. Yeah, let's Yeah, let's take the mustache graph, which was the absolute value of x, and now just reflect its negative pieces across the axis. So in red, here's your final graph. And now you get the crazy double Bactrian camel mustache graph. Wow. There you go. We finished. Perfect timing. Worksheet will be due tomorrow for this section. Um, no quiz tomorrow, though. We're just pressing on. So have a wonderful mismatched Wednesday. Eat some chocolate, too.